So we just uh, changed things around a little bit. When you have two amazing women as uh, speakers, they will make amazing things happen. And we just started chatting in the last literally three, four minutes. And we said, actually, wouldn't it be terrific if both of them are together? And, uh, and we have a discussion together. So uh, Adina and Mary both agreed that uh, they're more than delighted to uh, be together and have this discussion. So that's why it's taking just a little bit longer. Nicole from the FT is going to moderate the conversation. And uh, let me start by introducing Mary Erdos. The most important introduction is she's a Hoya. Okay. You know, that, uh, that theme keeps coming up again and again. And uh, Mary Erdos is CEO of JP Morgan's Asset and Wealth Management Division. And they only manage 2.4 trillion in private banking, uh, on the private banking and investment management side. Mary is also a member of the JP Morgan Chase Operating Committee. And uh, she's, uh, she got her undergraduate degree at Georgetown. Then she got her an MBA at Harvard. And I'm going to let Mary, as they start the conversation, tell us a little bit more about exactly what she does. And then we have uh, absolutely delighted to have Adina Friedman here. Adina is the president and CEO of NASDAQ. She assumed this role on January 1st, 2017. She's a member of the board. She brings more than 20 years of industry leadership and exp expertise and is credited with significant contributions that shaped NASDAQ's strategic transformation to a leading global exchange. And technology obviously plays a big role at the exchange as we've been hearing all morning. So ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to introduce Mary Erdos and Adina Friedman. Please welcome them. Why don't we sit here? Sure. Whatever you want. Yes. We'll, f we'll make All it right. work. So, so, so slight change of plans. <laughs> We're teaming up. <laughs> so um, thank you both for, for coming. It's great to have, um, to have you here. Um, I think given the, the venue, technology is a good place to start. It seems to be uh, you know, what's on everybody's minds and, um, you know, very much a part of the way that we view the future. So um, I guess just to start, I'd be interested in hearing, given how technology is advancing both in scope and, and pace, accelerating, um, and all the new financial products that have been introduced, are there issues around market stability that, that you're concerned about? Start? You want me to start? Why don't you go ahead and start sure. looking at it from the point of view of asset management? So, um, technology is obviously something that is is in our everyday life, including um, five-year-old children with devices. Like the whole world is is a completely different way of thinking. And so, that as that applies to a money management, it's pervasive in everything that we do. So, of course, we invest very heavily in our portfolio managers, our research analysts, and our traders. But each and every one of them is enabled with technology constantly. And so from the portfolio management and analyst standpoint, that means you know, lots and lots of big data, not to make the decision for them, but to help them to have everything at their fingertips to make it a little bit faster, a little bit um, sharper than other people, which of course has the um, unwanted effect of crowding out sort of smaller players who can't afford that, right? So if you imagine JP Morgan Chase, we bank half the households in the United States of America. So when we do that, we have a lot of data on what people do, buy, see, think, spend, save, trending, people starting to be delinquent. We can see that a lot faster than sort of the general data will tell you. So we have big data at our fingertips. You think about the person who's just trying to decide on, you know, stock A and stock B, that's a really hard thing to give them that same sort of access and information. So for us, that's really important for us to have an edge on decision making, and we use that there. But then when you get to the trading is really where our worlds come together um, and is very important, which is how do you constantly squeeze out every drop of a place where you don't need to do things with manual intervention, that you can do it faster, you can do it sharper, you can find best execution. And that's where all of the work that NASDAQ is doing uh, to be on the forefront of that. And of course, you know, their major constituents are the 
tech community first and foremost and lots of others addition to that. But that really helps them to have the edge and maybe Adina could you know, spend yeah. a little bit on, on how that's working and transforming in her 11, 10 months that she's been uh, on the job. Sure, well I would say obviously NASDAQ is a technology company and we look at serving all of our community with the most advanced technology including the asset management industry, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, but we have the asset management industry, the broker-dealer community, other exchanges and markets around the world, as well as our corporate clients. And we look at how we use technology to make it so all of them have the most successful interaction with the capital markets that they can have. And they all have different goals, and so this market stability issue is an important one. So if we look at the asset management industry, one of the things we're finding is as asset managers are becoming more sophisticated in how they are using technology to interact with the markets, they also have to become more sophisticated in how they're overseeing the activity and the behaviors of the people in their organizations. Mm -hmm. So we have our smart surveillance technology that serves 140 broker-dealer clients and, and most of the exchanges around the world and regulators, but we're now creating um, a new solution that really is geared towards asset management using behavioral analytics plus all the alerting that we have on trading so that we kind of can customize that so that asset managers, as they're getting more sophisticated, they have ways to make sure that they're mm -hmm. checking their people, checking exactly. their behaviors, but also that market stability issue and making sure that they're properly um, interacting with the market. Then there's also, of course, new technologies coming out around trade cost analysis, which I'm sure that a lot more asset managers are looking at to help them understand how that interaction can be more successful. And then more, more generally, technology is obviously a critical component of what we do so that we can create stable, fair markets around the world, not just our own, but we can use that technology to help other economies grow um, on the back of great market infrastructure. So if we take just a step back, what are some of the trends that you isolated over the next five or 10 years that you feel uh, both of your firms really need to be investing in now in order to be on top of that as the, the world goes more and more in those directions? Because I would imagine there are also trends that pretty much every business inside mm -hmm. the financial markets and out is thinking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say the first trend is a horrible one, uh, which is cyber reaching into each and every one of our daily lives, whether it's just an individual um, consumer of goods to somebody running a company. And depending on the kind of company that you run, um, that's the thing that we have to innovate so fast on every day. We spend $800, billion, um, $800 million a year on defending cyber, and that's not enough. Just imagine putting that to work every day to try and to defend the bad stuff from coming in. Why? Because we work at a bank. So the good old-fashioned, like, where do you go if you want to get the money? You, you, that would be a good first place to go. And so our defense mechanisms and our perimeter and everything that we do around it is it, you, you're, you're constant. I mean, you can't spend enough money to constantly try and stay ahead of the, the bad guys. And within there, you have to basically do what we call red teaming, but you have to red team your own, yourself. So you have to constantly try and break through. You have, to, you have to find people who are able to permeate the system, come through, be latent for very long periods of time so you don't know about it, and then find their way to be able to take the money, right? So the biggest fear is the wiring out of, of money in the bank. It's uh, along the lines of the recent hack that everybody uh, knows about. The, the real issue is not the company itself that leaked the information or your personal information. It's you. It's you. You're, now you're at risk, right? Your personal information is out there. So anyone, any day, can go under the radar, start spending little, you know, $19, $20 that won't show up on any of your screens because they have your date of birth, mother's maiden name, you know, everything that you ever needed to know, and they'll be able to find their way through lots of things that, that, you, that you can't even see. And so as one of the largest credit card companies in the world, like that's where we, we have to help. We have to help educate, and then of course we have to defend when we see those bad behaviors. So that's where you get into all of this technology can help you to see patterns of things. So if you don't normally spend $19.99 every you know, Monday at 10 a.m., we can pick that up. 
but, you, but that's not sophisticated enough for tomorrow, right? So you ask five or 10 years from now, and I have no idea. Five or 10 years from now is an eternity in technology space. We're just trying to stay, we're generally, you know, two, three, four years ahead of what the sort of mass population can, can see, and that, 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 even that will shorten over time. So I think that we do, we, we certainly agree with you in terms of the, the need to be ever vigilant and invest constantly in cyber. I think that if we look more holistically at the key higher level technology trends, I would see machine intelligence, which will then drive automations, mm -hmm. which as well as um, certainly the, the movement to the cloud, as well as the, the potential for things like the blockchain and new technologies to create a lot more efficiencies inside the, the, the financial system. And then, then you kind of layer on top of all of that the concept of quantum and the ability for computers to be ever faster in making very, very complex decisions. And you really have a different game when it comes to the financial services industry. Um, and that, I think, in the, you know, over a span of, is it five years or 10 years, really all of those technologies could really become integrated and truly implemented across the system. And what we try to do is say, okay, what does that world look like? How will an asset management a mass asset management firm interact with the markets? How will the broker dealers manage their trading? What, what risk can we take out of the system like post-trade, all of the capital that's trapped inside the banks associated with post-trade? But also, how can you make sure that you're surveilling that activity? All of the, you know, the guys who are trying to break in or basically manipulate the markets are also going to have that technology. So how do we make sure that our surveillance technology and our capabilities stay ahead of the trends that are coming. And so we've been very, very clear with our investors, with our clients, that we're embracing all of those technologies and we're trying to make sure we're in integrating them into what we're creating, which is the Nasdaq Financial Framework, so that we can have markets run in the cloud, we can pr introduce a lot more machine intelligence into decision making up at the asset management layer, we can introduce uh, faster decision making, and we can uh, take advantage of all the data that's really coming, or is here, but also it's going to be manipulable over so time. So that's a, an acquisition that you've made recently, right? Is something along the lines of uh, tapping more into the, the demand from asset managers for information. For information. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Sure. Well, I, so, so those trends are all things that we're doing to invest in organically through the Nasdaq Financial Framework. But certainly, as we look at the sophistication of asset managers, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you're developing your asset management strategies because, as you said, it's, a, it's an increasingly competitive game mm -hmm. for gathering assets. And the resources of the larger firms are going to be unparalleled. But there's also an opportunity for every asset manager to continue to think about how they compete. I do think that, in my opinion, the U.S. markets are the deepest, most liquid, Absolutely. most varied. Um, we have a huge opportunity. You probably have the stat, but it's like 77 trillion of investable assets today, growing to like 100 trillion yes. in a very short period of time. So if asset managers have better access to an understanding of how they compete, when they're not competitive, why they're not competitive, um, how do they build a winning strategy, how do they make sure that they're getting seen in front of asset owners, people who have the money. Um, so at investment is the, is the acquisition we made to make sure, and frankly, to be honest, J.P. Morgan was our banker on that deal, um, to, be, to make it so that the data analytics is more, are, are more available to them so they can, they can compete more effectively in an ever com more competitive space. So. And are, are those the kinds of tools that you're using yeah. more and more? Absolutely, and it's even, I mean, just think about how exciting it is to have that technology. Forget about what we can do as asset managers and as, and as um, capital, manage, capital flow management, right? Somewhere between mm -hmm. the two of us, and mm -hmm. companies like us, everything flows in the world from a capital market standpoint. But what does it mean for the, for the company investing, the pension fund investing, right. the sovereign wealth fund investing, or the end individual? Just think about all of that data. It's helpful to us. It's much more helpful to you. When I can feed to you your own data in a much more holistic way, if I can tell you that you know, your participants in your plan have been taking out less or have been growing more or their health and, their, and you feed in the health and wellness and you can be able to tell how they're gonna be able to retire and how much more you can leave them in higher risk assets for longer periods of time in order to have them have healthier retirements. When I can show that to you on a daily basis, when I can get that 21 year old who comes out of Georgetown and all they're thinking about 
is either paying off their student loans or like just paying for the rent and, and train them that each and every dollar you can just put in right there at that first moment and how that looks and compounds and get them on get them on that train early and show them people like you, right? Here's what people, here, here, and here's the best practitioners in the world, and this is what their portfolio looks like, and this is what their spending habit looks like. This is how much they're paying on rent. This is how much you're going out too much. You're too many Friday <laughs> nights. Too, your lunches are too, you know, too large at the tombs. You gotta cut it, cut it down a little bit. Because I can see people like you don't spend that much on a Wednesday, you know, whatever. All of that information back to the consumer is so powerful, and it should, should in the end, make for much smarter financial wise decisions on the part of the buyer, which is really our job, is to get the buyer the cheapest, most access to the capital markets, to the greatest companies on the planet, most of them are, which are based here in the United States of America, so that they can participate in that, in the growth as they go through life, which is our goal. Another big theme over the past, I would say, couple of years is this shrinking universe of companies that uh, are listed and are want and do want to go public. That the public markets are this idea that the public markets are not as attractive as they used to be, particularly to companies that are on the very cutting edge of innovation that used to be kind of the sizzle in the market. So, what are your thoughts on on these trends? I mean, it, I, I realize there's no silver bullet here, but what are some of the things that you think could be uh, addressed that would, would make the markets more appealing? Or is this just a, you know, a moment in time that, that will run its course? Well, I think that we've been pretty vocal in saying that you know, over the last 10 years or since 2000, I guess 2005, so since uh, the last 12 years, there are a thousand fewer public companies today than there were 12 years ago. So, so that to me is, is saying that it's not just a blip, it's something that we have to address. And then you say, well, what's the cause? And is that necessarily bad? I mean, maybe, maybe these companies are having better access to private capital and so it's okay. Well, I think that the answer to me is that there's, an, there's a huge role for private capital and having worked at a private equity firm, and I know that you um, provide access to private equity to a lot, of, um, a lot of investors. There's a huge role of private capital. But at the end of the day, there are two facts that we like to talk about. One is that between, since, 2000, since the year 2000, if you look at companies before they've gone public and after they've gone public, 86% of the job creation within those companies occurred after they went public. So there is still uh, a really important role of the public markets in driving growth and job creation in this country. And the second thing is the fact that wealth disparity becomes, I would say, more enhanced if you have more and more of these companies staying private longer. So if they can, to be honest, if they can afford to be a JP Morgan Asset Management client and be part of the feeder fund system and get access to private equity or get access to the venture, then they have access to all these amazing growth companies. But if they can't and they're an average saver, then they don't necessarily have as much access. There is some, but they're small slivers of an overall 401k vehicle or of a pension fund. So having them have better access to these companies when they're younger and still in that high growth mode gives them better access to savings and I would say makes it so that what Mr. and Mrs. 401k have the ability to invest in growth. And I couldn't agree more. And so, yeah, so I think it's our role in the industry as a bank, as an asset management firm, and as an exchange to find ways to make it so that it's a more inviting environment for companies to go public. And I know Tom Whitman spent time on that this morning, and the Treasury report is kind of reiterating some of our key, um, our key recommendations around But that. It, it's all about regulations. I mean, you can't, you can't just have one general counsel when you want to go public. You need two or three. You can't just have one you know, set of compliance people. Now you need, you know, three major ones, ones to check the ones that are doing the first checking in order to check the checker. Like, it, it, is, <laughs> it, is, it, is, ma it is madness at some level. And while lots of regulations, well, all regulations, I think, start with the good intention of getting the right thing for the end user, this has stifled it, and now you have a thousand less companies. A thousand less companies means exactly what Adina said. You can't, like, you, you don't, as a normal human being, you can't get access to participate in the growth of American entrepreneurialism. It's the greatest co country in the world to create entrepreneurial companies, and you, general, you know, person on the street, can't get access to it. You need them to be public through the listings of our exchanges here. And we've got to stop the regulations to get them back into the place that they're supposed to be, 
which is providing transparency and all of the great things, but not so that every filing you have on a monthly, monthly basis is like this, and that's what it is. And so it's, it's completely onerous on any company, not to mention you know, the financial services industry, which is in a whole other stratosphere. Yeah, and I, and I think that in terms of the, those disclosure obligations, we like to distinguish between what information is really necessary for an investor to make an informed financial decision and what is, first of all, some politically motivated disclosures? Um, and I think the Treasury report calls a few out. Yep. You know, conflict minerals. I think there's another one, some metal thing. Um, so there's some of that. Um, and then how much disclosure is really necessary on a quarterly basis for an annual basis? Or maybe you bifurcate it and you say, well, look, if you're under a billion dollars in market cap, you have certain disclosure obligations. And once you get to a certain size where you can afford to have additional people on your legal staff supplying additional disclosures, then you have you know, this quarterly 10Q as well as the 10K. Our view is the earnings releases provide the vast majority of the information that investors read on a quarterly basis, but then you still have to file this, you know, in our case, it's probably a 100-page document every quarter. So, and then you also have the, the 10K. So maybe you have earnings releases with a 10K, um, or you do the UK system where you have you know, semi-annual disclosure obligations with some shorter disclosures on the other quarters. That would be easier. And then on top of that, you've got the biggest issue, I think, that the, well, is proxy access and proxy um, mm -hmm. advisory reform. Mm -hmm. So you've got a $2,000 shareholder who has the ability to put any proxy proposals on your proxy, and then you have to manage that for the next several, you know, several weeks. Generally, aver on average, costs between seventy and hundred thousand dollars for every company to manage every single proxy mm -hmm. proposal that's put on. Six investors submitted 33% of all proxy, um, proxy acts or proxy proposals in 2015. Six small 2,000 share or dollar investors. So is that really the best time and money spent by the companies when it's the same ones? And by the way, they just put them back on there every single year. Absolutely. So the Treasury report talks about um, that issue and trying to make it harder to put repeat proposals on, making it higher to have a threshold for investors, things like that. There are a lot of, there's a lot we can do to make, that are very practical, very tangible, that makes it easier and better to be a public company. So it seems like, and I know this has been a theme that you've talked about for a while, is this idea that maybe not necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach, yes. that we should be tailoring uh, the obligations to the the relative size and, and importance of the company in, in the markets. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that there should be some changes on the regulatory side of invest in terms of investors? Should smaller investors be allowed to participate in to a greater degree in these private deals? Ooh, that's a good question for you. Well, I mean, yes, and we try to provide that. Um, there are uh, rules of qualified investors, so the amount of money that you have to have, which we continue to try and find ways to give clients access while remembering that it's an illiquid investment and you've got to be you know, obviously aware of that and whoever's putting your portfolio together has to size it right so that it can never get you in trouble like a lot of people got in 2008. And which, by the way, is still in the memories of most people. So if you wonder why we're sitting in a market that continues to go up every single day and you know, some people feel it but not enough and you still look at the gobs of cash that are just awash in everyone's portfolios and you ask yourself why, the answer is because every moment of the fall of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 is still on the forefront of a lot of people's minds and they don't ever want to go through that again. So having that balance of what's liquid and what's illiquid and then being able to ride through that is, is, um, is really important. But I mean, that's a, yes, that's important. It's more important to have companies mm -hmm. listed so that everyone can have equal access with a dollar. And that's, I think, the, that's, that's the absolute goal that our country should continue to strive for. We are the deepest, widest capital markets on the planet, and we need to stay that way. So the, another thing that they, the Treasury sounded out in, in that report was the influence of M&A. So you know, just to round out the discussion, should we maybe be having some more st stricter rules about, M about antitrust, particularly in the tech sector? I, I would say I'm, I'm not a believer in that. I think that at the end of the day, um, as long as the consumer wins or the clients win, then M&A can be very, I think it actually you know, can be a, a good thing. And frankly, if you make it harder for companies to come together 
that are natural that naturally should come together. At the end of the day, the, the client ultimately is not the winner there. Um, and in some cases, some companies may not be able to survive in a very disruptive and changing environment if they can't consolidate to compete against some of these larger technology companies that really are disrupting the in, in certain industries. So I am a huge believer in free markets. So I, I'm not a believer in trying to put restrictions, further restrictions on M&A just to try to keep companies alive as opposed to doing what's natural for the ultimate benefit of a customer. Obviously, DOJ will look at it and say, well, if it's not in the benefit of the customer, and it really does create a market power that is ultimately destructive to the client experience and, frankly, pricing, then that's their job. But other than that, certainly I think these companies should be allowed to innovate, should be allowed to come together, should be allowed to do that to be able to compete with some pretty disruptive forces out there. I don't know if you have agree. Anything. Nope. I'm wondering if maybe we should pause for some questions. Now, since we changed the schedule, I'm not exactly sure how the timing's gonna work, but maybe it's a good idea to see if, if anybody has any questions at this point. Hi. My name's Li Yang, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question is really for uh, financial situation whether it is handled by the brokerage in the NASDAQ or, or NYSE. And also for Morgan Stan, okay. JP Morgan, as I wonder, first is how much lobbies cost that you have spent and how much you spend on advertising or you sponsor, like they say, the study by the think tank. And how do you have handle your settlement with the DOJ or other local government for the foreclosures? Why do you only settle for the 2008 rather than the other years? They maybe have a lot of unjust cancellation or credit card, they damage their reputation, and also unjust foreclosure of the homes when there's no default probably just for other reason. And that's not really clear by the government agency to, to the consumer. So do you have that kind of consumer information? Sure. Uh, you want to start with the exchange question? Are you Can you repeat? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't quite understand the exchange-related question. I know that there was something related to consumer protection. but. My question is, uh, how much money you spend for lobby Oh. Uh, and uh, for the advertisement or for sponsor or event that, that you put to the, uh, any social event, uh, local or think tank or civic organizations? So for, from the exchanges specifically? Uh, I yeah, mean, I honestly, we, we don't publicize that. We're a public company, so we, we have to, um, but that's incorporated into our broader you know, marketing and government relations um, budgets. I would say that we actually um, use our own teams and our own people to help us make sure that our, you know, any sort of opinions that we have are heard by government officials. And um, you know, we, we, we do it ourselves, essentially. So, and, and we're not really big thinker, users of think tanks, as a general matter. Yeah, I, the questions you're asking on the consumer side are very good and very important ones. And there were a lot of lessons learned uh, as we went through the crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, the, there's lots of points of making loans, packaging loans, repackaging them, putting them out, who are the owners, who are the buyers, who are the sellers, and the end person that touches it are the banks. And so no matter how you slice it, the rub is right here between the banks and the consumer. And that's what the CFTC is there to make sure that we protect everything that the consumer does and that the banks do the right thing by the consumer. As J.P. Morgan Chase is one of the largest financial services firms uh, in the world, worked very hard during 2008 and 2009 to help work through lots of bad things that were happening in the economy. And we think that we did uh, as much as we could to be able to help people. And, um, and you can see from the results of the consumer today that we are in a much better situation than we were even as we headed into 2007, uh, which felt like a very good and frothy time in the market. So we have much healthier consumers today. They have much much less leverage. They are much more educated. 
Um, they are, they, there's much less predatory pricing and bad things that it used to exist in the marketplace and those providers are no longer in existence and we think that the markets are, are much better and safer for the consumer as a result. Hi, uh, Anu Sharma with Morgan Stanley. A uh, quick question for you is when you look at the technology in terms of the exchanges as well as on the wealth management side, and I happen to come from both sides of your world. Hello, Adina, how are you? Fine, how are you? And uh, there was a time where we saw basically two floor-based market exchanges and one electronics stock market. So when you're looking at technology swinging, and I have clients that are 70 years and older and I'm on the asset management side, they're scared to death of technology, and then you get clients that are 35 years and younger who follow it blindly and just give everything they can to it and don't worry about the, the protocols. Is there a point where the pendulum goes from one end to the other where technology will start to come back, where the human element will be somewhat involved? Because we went from a floor-based model and now we see high-frequency trading and now we see the advisors and now they're going to companies like Betterment who are all robo-advisors. Mm -hmm. So is there a point where the pendulum swings back? Sure. Well, I would start by saying I think that uh, I'm a huge believer in the combination of man and machine. So I, I think certainly in the asset management space, in my personal opinion, I think that you're going to have some strategies over um, that are really just index driven. So they're very passive. You're going to have hyperactive kind of uh, quant driven. And then you're going to have a huge amount of space in the middle for human judgment. And I think that human judgment can come in the form of private equity, can come in the form of public asset management, you know, public company asset management. Um, and I think that it's the combination of those things that make our markets healthy. And so when the market swings too much to one or the other, it, it probably will correct itself because of the fact that it will, that balance is very, very important to the long-term health of the capital markets. So that's my personal belief. I also think that the pie is growing very quickly and so if you, you know, if, even if there's more, um, more assets going into passive today or more assets going into private equity today, I think that the overall pie continues to grow very quickly. So it will continue to have a huge human element to it. In terms of the markets and just the, the trading on the markets, I do believe that interaction with the markets will continue to be um, largely electronically driven, but there are definitely very important moments when humans can certainly interact with the market, I mean, they can interact with the markets all day. They're making human decisions to make investment choices. It's just a matter of the machines executing the trades. Um, but also, certainly on IPOs, we have the underwriters who have total control over the, um, the IPO open. Um, and, and there are a lot of other times during the day where the humans get very involved, um, certainly in the opening and closing auctions and things like that. Yeah, and the question as it relates to wealth management is an excellent one. So there are lots of people, as you say, who are afraid of technology and there are lots of people who are blindly using it. Neither one is a, is a, is a good idea. I, I think that the ability to have technology help you make smarter, better decisions, sort of show you, visualize outcomes, help you to see things in a more clear way, make sure that you're not getting somebody doing undue trading on your account or other things. You know, there's lots of sort of good ways, again, to the, to the sort of watching for the bad stuff. That can also be very helpful. Mm -hmm and that can lead to good answers. Blindly listening to some algorithm tell you to buy or sell something is only gonna end in tears at some point in time. It's for sure going to happen. And blindly having a robot manage your money is also gonna end in tears at some point. And so you can't have that. You know, Siri is not gonna hold your hand through 2008, 2009 and like walk you through what's happening and why it's happening. It's either gonna keep buying as the thing goes down, which you don't want, or it's going to sell because it has some algorithm that says sell, which you don't want. It's going to have to figure that out. You need human interaction. It's absolutely no different than the hospitals of the world. You wouldn't go to a hospital today that didn't employ super modern technology to be able to see a particular disease and how it was treated in lots of hospitals around the world and all that big data that they use. But you wouldn't let the robot work on your body. You need a human being that takes all that information, that synthesizes it, that looks at, your, at you in the whites of your eyes and takes the whole picture and says, I think we will apply these portions and these portions and this is what we're going to do for you. And I think that's exactly what the wealth management industry will be for as far as I can see. Thank you. 
Um, you've both spoken about how important it is to have public companies, listed companies, and we want to do more. Uh, so index providers, Standard & Poor's, and FTSE Russell have started addressing the issue of shareholder voting rights. I, I want to just uh, hear your comments on sure, it. Sure, sure. Yeah, we definitely have a difference of opinion. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, I would say, and we've been pretty vocal about that too. So in our blueprint for revitalizing the US capital markets, we do specifically state that we support dual class structures um, for companies that are looking to go public. I think that, and there's a specific reason for that. So if we think about companies that are founder led and are looking therefore to go into the public markets, um, there, there's a one big gating issue, which is, being able to feel like they continue to have control over their company as a public company. So there are choices we can make. Um, number one, in the current structure where we do allow for uh, multiple class structures, the investor gets to make a choice. It's fully disclosed to them as to whether or not this company has one or two classes or multiple classes. It's fully disclosed to them that the public shares may or may not have certain voting rights. And the investor can make a choice. Do I want to be a financial investor in this company or don't I? Um, and they are just making a decision to be a financial investor instead of a governance investor. Um, and I believe that they are given that choice and it's fully disclosed and therefore that should continue to be available to them. Because the alternative is that that founder doesn't go public. That company stays in the private hands, they continue to find ways to, to capitalize their business in the private space and therefore that investor gets no ability to invest in that company at all. And I don't think that's the right choice. So I'd rather give where a full disc work what we call a disclosure economy. Disclose the information, allow an investor to make an informed decision, and then allow them to become a financial owner of that company, but even if they don't have full governance rights. And that's our position. And we will continue to run our index business along those lines. So the NASDAQ 100, the biotech, and all of our indices will continue to allow um, multiple class structures. <clears throat> Ladies, good afternoon. Um, Steve Cohen, Solix Technologies. Adina, you and I had met in New York, and I appreciate the introduction to Terry. I guess this is more for Mary. Uh, same question, which I had asked Adina in New York. How is JP Asset uh, leveraging big data technology to sort of generate a different uh, approach or get different customers than uh, your competition? What are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. that? So um, we think that it will be basically table stakes to have very sophisticated data, technology, everything to help make better decisions to have a portfolio that's more proper for you than it is for your neighbor. And, and then that will constantly be augmented and um, refined so that that will continue to get better and better over time. But where you can take it to a whole other level is to actually feed back your own big data to you in a way that to can be customer, helpful like you to you in, in, in other ways, okay? So let me give you a for instance, and this relates to the private markets. So we happen to one, run the largest uh, core real estate uh, fund in the U United States of America, and so we happen to own a whole lot of malls. And there's lots of good stuff happening in malls, and there's lots of bad stuff happening in malls. And they're going through a complete transformation of sort of who's gonna make it, who's gonna not, what's gonna take up that space, is it more of an experience than it is, and then you go home and you shop online and all that uh, moving, all the, all the moving pieces that we have in that. If you happen to own a share of our core private equity fund, you should have all that data at your fingertips. I should, because you're an owner of it. I should let you know price per square foot of the malls in Southern California versus the malls in Minnesota. Which one, which, which, um, which, malls have you know, sort of default or decreasing rates? What kind of retail companies are coming in for new leases for, versus not? It should just make you smarter. You can do whatever you want with it, right? But to be able to give you, the buyer, even more information to do whatever you want with, because you own it, is really important. So you can imagine how that also applies to public companies. And being able to package that and give it back to you in however ways you want to know. So if you happen to run some kind of a company yourself, in a particular industry, you can ask for all the information that relates to that industry and you should get that served to you by your asset manager in a way that isn't even thought of today. And I think that's the super exciting part of what all this big data can do. Because big data for the sake of big data is just a lot of data. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Akash. I'm a freshman at Georgetown. And I have two questions, one for Dina and one for Mary. My question for Dina is, the, there's been prevalence of ICOs using Ethereum. And what are your thoughts of that? How is NASDAQ going to take advantage of that? And my question for Mary is, where do you think the future of asset management is? I've heard a lot about it moving towards passive index funds and PE, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So ICOs are a really interesting um, construct that have come into the market very, very quickly. Can you explain what ICOs are? Sure. So, well, I, I don't know if I can, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so initial coin offering basically is... It's, an, it's a way to raise money in, I would say, kind of a crowdfunded type of manner where you basically put up your business plan or you put up your concept or maybe you're putting up a real business that's already operating into um, a portal that allows people to make a decision as to whether or not they want to, quote, unquote, invest in that, port, in that, invest, that business, but in the construct of them getting the potential to join in future profits. Um, and basically, they get a, um, a Bitcoin or a, you know, an, an Ethereum um, certificate that establishes the fact that they have some sort of investment inside that company. So people are saying this is an alternative to an IPO. Um, I think that the SEC has come down and said, well, then if it sounds like and smells like a security, it should be a security and should be regulated as such. So the question is, are they going to be regulated as an IPO would be regulated? There are reasons why IPOs are highly regulated. You want to make sure that everyone has equal access to information, that they understand that there are certain disclosure obligations that a company has to make before you, so you can make an informed investment decision, that an equity is an, a piece of ownership. It's a concept of ownership of that company. You're, in the, you're essentially in the cap table for a reason, and you're sitting in the stack um, for a specific reason in terms of your rights to liquidation rights, essentially. But ICOs are none of those. So there is no standard for disclosure. There's no um, protections for the investors. And, um, and they're, they're not gaining any sort of ownership rights. They're gaining the potential right to a future profit, potentially. Um, and there's no government you know, or, or in no, any sort of oversight of that activity by any government official. So I would call that a bleeding edge type of construct, mm. uh, just like crowdfunding has been a pretty bleeding edge type of construct. NASDAQ doesn't tend to get engaged in the bleeding edge. We get engaged in the leading edge. So as we look at whether or not that construct becomes standardized, whether it does uh, become a security, whether it can be regulated as such. We have something called the NASDAQ private market where we could accommodate those types of capital raising activities, but we're not ready to establish it as, um, as an established practice. So could, we, we are certainly invest, looking at it and understanding it, but we're not currently investing in it. Could you see NASDAQ getting into cryptocurrencies at any point? Or so we are very engaged in the blockchain and the underlying technology behind the block um, behind Bitcoin, and we are actually integrating the blockchain across our entire market infrastructure stack. And we do have we've deployed it inside the Nasdaq private market, and we've partnered with Citibank um, on that. So we have a, a very good understanding of it. But in terms of the actual um, application of the blockchain towards cryptocurrencies, at this point. Uh, in, in the Nordics, we actually do do some work with a, 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 essentially a cryptocurrency index. Um, so in the Nordics, that the government there has kind of taken a different tack. But in the United States, they have not. Um, and they're not currently ready to um, embrace it in the same way that other, other governments have. So at this point, we continue to evaluate it. We, we may or may not get involved. Our technology is used, however, in the Bitcoin space, but we're, but we're as a market ourselves, a market operator, we have not yet made that decision. And then you asked a great question about active versus passive management, which um, seems to be the question of the last sort of five, six years. And it's a funny one for me because I think that there's lots of room for passive management in people's portfolios where you just want to set it, forget it, and you're not going to look at it for another 50 years and it's there. There's, uh, there's, it's inconceivable to me that you wouldn't also think of actively managed parts of your portfolio. First of all, at the portfolio level, you need to be active because you don't stay the same. You don't stay a freshman in college for the rest of your life. Your age changes, your needs change, your risk profile changes, your life changes, your your um, obligations change, and so with that, your portfolio has to change. You have to be very active about that. And then when you actually graduate from college and you come work at J.P. Morgan Chase, we'll show you how when you sit in front of one CEO and another CEO, 
there are very stark differences. And so the, only the human brain can say, which one of those two people do I think has got a better strategy for five years from now? There is no technology in the world that's going to tell you that. That's a human judgment. And that human judgment is a critically important one for the capital markets, and that's what makes the capital markets the capital markets, and that will never go away. It will just have, uh, you'll just have other means of being able to invest. And so it's, it's very difficult to say for an entire portfolio, you should own the 500 largest companies today, period, end of sentence, because those are not necessarily and probably not at all going to be the 500 largest companies of tomorrow, and it's someone's job to figure out which ones those are. It's probably worth noting that over 40% of those companies have had no revenue growth. Thank you. you just think about owning 40%, over 40% of a portfolio that has no revenue growth. That's not a good investment for the future. You have to figure out how you're thinking about what's the right investment for the future. And that's why you should study really hard in school on your math, science, econ, and business school courses, and then come and work for us, and we'll, we'll use that brain of yours. We'd be very excited. We're one of the heaviest recruiters from Georgetown, so we're really super proud of all of the people that we get from here. Looking forward I to know it. we you. can go on and on with questions here, but I did promise that we'll end on time because uh, I know you have other commitments that you need to get uh, to. Please join me in thanking Adina, Mary, and Nicole.